Well, greetings all. My name is Peter Moore from the Department of Engineering from La Trobe University. And uh, we uh, have an honor today of having uh, Professor Guerin Roux here, who's going to be giving an industry presentation to our engineers and an exciting new subject called Ideas to Innovation. So I thought I'd actually uh, quickly go through uh, Guerin's uh, presentation and put a few questions to him, more from the perspective of young professionals, students and engineers. So thank you for taking the time. Pleasure. For coming out to our beautiful Bandura campus. Absolutely. If you could just give us a summary of what is being depicted here. Yes, um, when you look at that slide you see a sequence of dots. They have two colors and they each dot represent countries. Uh, so the blue dots are countries that are non-resource dependent and the red dots are countries that are resource dependent. And what you find here is a plotting of how complex an economy is and what its prosperity level is. And what you can find is that the higher the complexity, I will in a second explain the complexity here, the higher the complexity is, the higher the uh, uh, prosperity of the country. And what we know from research is that the, the complexity is the driver of prosperity, so it's not a correlation, it's actually a causality. Uh, the complexity issue actually is means that the, the more complex you are, the more you are able to produce things that, that nobody else can produce. So that is what it's about. And the larger chunk of your economy that is able to produce things that nobody else can produce, the higher the complexity of the economy. In other words, if you're on the right, you can produce a very large share of your economy as things that nobody else can produce and on the left you can produce almost nothing that nobody else cannot also produce. Now if you look at this you will see that there are two lines through the slides. The lower line of course is the blue line and the upper line is the red line. And what that tells you is that on average an economy that is resource dependent gets a boost because of its resources, which is not surprising. You know, you dig something out, you sell it, you sell it off. You have a contribution to your economy that you don't have if you do not have those resources. Now, when I arrived in Australia first, around about 2011, and in the, my longer stay here, I. Um, I did this plot and uh, you know, with the help of the data that is collected primarily by Hausmann and a couple of people in the US. And uh, what I saw immediately was that Australia, which you can see ringed in green here, is very high up uh, with a relatively mediocre complexity. So what that told me was that on these 2010 data, um, since we know that countries that are lower than the average uh, prosperity level on the level of complexity would tend to increase the prosperity and countries that are higher have a higher prosperity and that the complexity justifies tends to decrease it. What it told me is likely that Australia's prosperity will go down unless it chooses to increase its complexity. Uh, and of course now when we look back from 2016 we can see that that actually happened. So Australia's prosperity level now is substantially less and the way you primarily see that is through a rapidly increasing budget deficit because obviously prosperity is now um, maintained on a level that cannot be afforded. In other words our underlying prosperity level is substantially lower than the one we see and the price we pay in Australia is an increasing budget deficit. Okay, so we see here at the top of, um, of the axis here, yeah. economic complexity around two is, is the maximum. We have Japan, Germany, yeah. and Switzerland. Switzerland yeah. So they're the top nations in terms they of are complexity. Indeed. Yes. What I was surprised about to see here is, is New Zealand. Yes. It's significantly higher. higher than Australia. Yes. So what is, what's that saying? <laughs> what it is saying is that, that Australia has very small share of its economy that produces things that nobody else can produce on a global market perspective. It does not take into account if you produce something and sell to your neighbor in terms of a domestic market. Mm -hmm. It only looks at the international markets because that is what generates prosperity from a national perspective. So you can have a company doing something unique in, uh, in Adelaide selling it to Melbourne. That will not really turn up in the statistics because it is a zero-sum game okay. within, within the national economy. So you see, there it tells you a number of things. Firstly, it tells you that New Zealand is a likely a more open market. It 
probably competes as, with the largest share of its economy on the world market. It's been forced then to learn how to balance between price-based competition and non-price-based competition. And as a consequence, it has developed a number of firms that are able to produce things that other firms in the global scenario cannot produce and that that increases its economic complexity. And if you look how New Zealand's economy has done over the last five, six years, it has done substantially better than Australia's economy. So we can certainly learn from uh, our friends across the Tasman. Uh, at least when it comes to uh, competing on a global market with small firms, yes. Okay, fascinating. And this chart is <coughs> the well, trend? What, um, what I said in the previous slide was basically that you have two choices in 2010. You could either decide to increase your complexity, uh, which would require a set of pretty clear industry policy choices, or you can decide to accept that your um, prosperity is going to go down. And what actually happened was that you decided through policy choice to reduce their economic complexity, oh uh, and primarily by the decision to kick out the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, automotive industry is one of the most complex industries. It's not the most complex, but it is one of the most complex industries that exist. And by losing the automotive industry over the coming couple of years, uh, we will reduce our economic complexity by a not insignificant uh, chunk. Yeah. Right, that's one of our last great uh, industries of complexity left in this country. Uh, of size, yes. Yeah. There are other industries that are complex, but they're generally small, things like medical devices and you know, there are issues in defense and so on. But as a whole, they are relatively small. The largest industry that remains of a high level of complexity, in other words, if we multiply size with um, complexity differential to where we are today, it will be primarily in some of the defense industries. Okay. And the big one is the submarine. All right. Basically showing the trend over the next 10 to 20 years. So if you can yep. provide a summary here. Yeah. If you, you, I'm sure you have followed the debate that goes on with, uh, you know, basically that jobs will disappear and technology will take over. Um, the, the, um, that, that discussion itself is nothing new. It's been going on every time you've had a kind of technology shift. So the way I phrase it is that it's, it's technology driven productivity improvements. Because if you have a productivity improvement in a company that exceeds the market growth of that company, in other words, the underlying growth of the, of the market that the company serves is lower and the company does not increase its market share, but its productivity improvement is high, that means that it can satisfy next year's demand with fewer people. So as your productivity improvement goes up and as your market matures, uh, employment opportunities will decrease unless you, you grasp a larger share of market, which is you can't count on that generally. So what we are seeing now is a fairly rapid increase in technology driven productivity improvements. And historically, um, the first sector that was hit by that was agriculture. And, you know, you're talking 100 years ago and so on. So, so today what we see is the result. We have a relatively low, in the OECD world, a relatively low employment share of agriculture. It makes low single digits in most economies, but it produces substantially more food than they ever produced before. So we've had a, a benefit in terms of output from this technology-driven productivity improvement, but a negative impact in terms of employment. The next sector that was hit was basically manufacturing. That's, you know, for most of the times so of most of you that listen and have worked for a while, you know that technology driven productivity improvement in manufacturing is the norm. You know, you mm -hmm. improve new equipment, capital equipment, and productivity goes up. And that means that almost every single large manufacturing firm in the world is constantly. Uh, shedding employees on a yes. slow and ready pace because its productivity improvement is higher than the growth in the market they serve. What is new is that, uh, that a number of these uh, new uh, technologies, primarily in the broader ICT domain, you know, automation of different times, artificial intelligence, you know, whatever you choose to call it, robotics and so on, are impacting service economies and service sector. And that hasn't really happened before. So if you look historically, the productivity improvement annually over the last 10 to 20 years in manufacturing in the OCD world averages around 3% per year, whereas the productivity improvement in services is about a tenth of that, so 0.3%. And, and of course, if I now introduce a, a tool that dramatically increases productivity in the service sector to maybe 6%, 
you can imagine the impact that that will have on jobs in the service sector. They're really going to be shedded at a high pace. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, on the good news side is that over time we will get more jobs, jobs we don't know what they are again, but there will be quite a, a long period where we will lose jobs. And the jobs we are going to lose is what this slide is talking about. It's primarily the so-called middle jobs. So on the, on the right-hand side here, you will see there will be a growth in high-skilled jobs. And what that requires is three skill domains. It requires the kind of domain-specific skills. So if you are a lawyer, you need to be very good at law. If you're an engineer, you need to be very good at whatever engineering domain you're in. The next thing it requires is a creative problem-solving capability. And if I wanted to express that in simple terms, is the ability to think on your feet, to give in a problem and come up with a solution here and now quickly. That would work. Uh, and the last one is interpersonal skills, the ability to interact with other people, working in team and generally being able to have an emotional connection to the environment around you, which is made up of human beings. So on the right hand side, what you have, for example, is the barrister that argues a case in front of court. He will have to have, or she will have to have all those skills. They will be able to hand questions and issues and you know, on their feet. They will be able to have interpersonal skills to connect emotionally, be they with a the jury or a judge or whoever it is. And of course, they have to be very good at the, the legal system. So they will be in demand. And the reason they will be in demand is A, there are very few of them. Um, and B, they have become substantially more productive because behind them is now no longer people. It's a 24-7 artificial inf uh, intelligence system that does all the, uh, the pre-trial preparation work, that does all the discovery scenarios. So what you used to have is that, for example, in the Class Act lawsuit in the pharmaceutical space, you know, the, the discovery phase where you look for facts and so on used to require you to read on average 30 million pages. For law firms in the U.S., this was a fantastic boon. They can invoice every hour of it. They had a back office. They did all these kind of issues. Now the chief discovery officer sits down with a piece of smart software. And it goes through the first couple of pages. And as a consequence of that, uh, the, you know, the machine now understands what they're looking for. So it does the 30 million pages in three minutes. So your back office just goes completely irrelevant and got fired. So this is what we see in the medium skilled jobs. They're all, they're all gone. No? So the generic uh, jobs, generic law, generic uh, yep. accounting. accounting, they will all gone. Yep. There is, if your sons and daughters, or if you who watch this are studying to become law, lawyers and accountants, my unfortunately have to tell you some bad news. And that is the likelihood you're going to get a job in that area is very low. Okay, so what areas should people be focusing on? The STEM? Uh, well, 75% of all jobs that we know likely going to appear uh, require STEM skills. So STEM is critical, but STEM is just a domain-specific skill area. You need the other two. You know, you are not going to be an incredibly brilliant employee in most scenarios unless you also have the creative solving capability and the interpersonal skills to make. Okay, the emotional intelligence. Yes, Very absolutely. important. Yes. So want to make sure you develop those. Yes. Um, considering this dynamic, uh, and also globally, what advice would you give universities, such as La Trobe, under these circumstances, for this dramatic change? Well, it, it, <laughs> it follows a bit from what you just said. Universities are very good at providing the domain-specific skills. Um, what they are not so good at is the other two. So how does the university help you to think creatively on your feet, resulting in a good solution here and now. How do universities help you develop your emotional intelligence in order to be excellent at working in groups with other cultures, with other skill domains, and understand their paradigms? So the first thing that I think universities have to do is to, to redefine what they mean by a good output product in the term of a student. You know? So it has to be a student that is not only excellent in the domain specific skills but they have to have the other areas that's the first issue then i think universities should have in my personal opinion a um, a stronger view on the ethics of the future labor market related to the products they offer so in other words why do universities not tell people who want to study forensic science or law or accounting that the probability you're going to get a job is very low. Uh, in other words, 
if you don't tell them that and say that we are only here to answer up to demand from students, you are actually profiting from information asymmetry. You know more than they do and you do not provide them the opportunity to make an insightful choice around a future where their probability of getting employment or being part of the labor market is going to be higher. The other area is also to, to not focus only on the I mean, there's a lot of talk about the digital space and digital impact and all those kinds of things. And that's absolutely right. And, you know, it's one of those key enabling technologies. But there are eight or nine other key enabling technologies which are going to be equally important, albeit with a little bit of a different timeline. So all of us now are looking at things like ICT and digital and talking about everything from digital landing pads to digital entrepreneurs to digital this and digital that and the industry 4.0 and so on. That's all very important. And it, that's what we're going to see first. But the next after that will be things like like you know, um, biotechnology in the broadest definition, your microbial consortia engineering, the understanding of the changing production system for things like chemical industry and food industry. Uh, we will have things like advanced materials, the ability to create systems. So there is a whole host of uh, key enabling technology domains which will in the future have similar impacts as ICT is seen to be having today. Uh, so universities have to not fall in the trap of just giving courses for what is needed today, but also courses for what is needed tomorrow. And that is very important. Well, it's a complex problem, isn't it? It is a very complex problem. Probably your last question before we, uh, we move on. Um, is having an advanced manufacturing sector fundamental to ensuring that Australia's higher education sector is also globally of a high caliber? Uh, that depends on what you want the higher education sector to do. So mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at the higher education sector as a Firstly, a closed system where you are educating people who are going to get a job as a researcher to produce research output primarily in the form of articles. Um, then you don't need a manufacturing sector because you will be able to do that all on your own, very much like Australia has done for a long time. Where you are. So in summary, if, you, if you're going to continue to do what you do now, which is to say that the Australian taxpayer is uh, subsidizing uh, research, the benefit of which is a high ranking in academic league tables, but where the research outcomes are being commercialized outside the country, which is done today, that's fine. The question is for how long can you keep doing that? Uh, and then the next level up you will do as a university then is to try to look at alternative income streams, which is primarily then education cross-subsidizing research. Mm -hmm. And then you risk falling in the trap that you look at your international students as a means of increasing cross-subsidization, which means you drive down the cost per student in that area. Uh, and that risk reducing the perceived quality. So although it tactically may increase the economic benefits to the university, it strategically commits suicide on the reputational level. On the other hand, if you want to have a, a, a issue around uh, a self-sustaining system, then you need a very sophisticated industry who constantly are able to A, put to use the outcomes from research and B, demand research that isn't done and then will be done to deliver outcome. And in this balance between um, you know, uh, applied research and not yet applied research, uh, you are able to generate a system that, that keeps moving forward. And you tend to see that in, uh, in universities that rank very highly on the cooperation with industry scenarios. So if you go for, for the ranking, for example, the Leiden ranking was very good because that balances for the size of universities. Mm -hmm. They have two ranking systems. The first one is academic performance. And I think the top Australian university will be somewhere around position number 40. It's another university, this town that we probably shouldn't mention by name mm -hmm. then if we're here. Um, and then uh, if you go to the other ranking where you look at universities who are really good at contributing to industry, the top university in Australia is around 250 position, you know, it's down there. And uh, it is um, uh, UTAS. Uh, so, UTAS? Yeah. Oh, University of Tasmania. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, it's, it's, so the interesting issue is, 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 that, is that difference. You know, the, there's a, a, there are totally different universities in the two rankings. And mm -hmm. the second one is the ranking list are completely different. Whereas if you look at the, uh, universities in the Germanic world, which you will be familiar with, you know, be that uh, uh, Germany or Sweden, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland is an exception here, but Germany and Sweden, you tend to find the reverse. 
the universities on the academic side are not incredibly high up in the ranking, but they are very, very high up on the industry relationship performance. Yeah. Whereas Switzerland is an exception in the world because it's high on both. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, the Germanic countries uh, have a two-tier university system. Yes which I believe would result in that. Absolutely, it yeah. does indeed. One, one tier is focused on producing industry-ready graduates yes. uh, and working directly with industry, yep. and the other tier of the university sector is more focused on producing PhD research-ready graduates. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But even they are not, if you look at the top 100, they are not really that high up. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Now I and, know. The, and the issue is that that is not important. Okay, why yeah. is that? It is just important to be good enough because what determines how important you are is actually how well industry wants to work with you. And industry only work with you if you're good, but good in what industry is interested in. Yeah, a big thank you on behalf of Engineer La Trobe. And we look forward to seeing you out here again uh, in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, Peter. thank you. Thanks. All the best. Thank you.